Pramod is uh, someone who I'm sure a lot of you will know, heard about him, uh, but this hopefully will get you a bit more closer look at some of the amazing work he's been doing. I specifically wanted Pramod's session to kind of as a closing keynote for the, the conference, uh, because some of the work he's done uh, hopefully will inspire all of you when you leave this conference and uh, take that forward. Uh, Pramod has been the chief uh, architect of Aadhaar, uh, and then he also moved on to be the chief architect for the India stack, uh, where they provide APIs for uh, Aadhaar, for eKYC. So you're able to do digital KYCs for UPI. Of course, uh, I'm sure everyone's aware of UPI. Uh, they also have uh, e-signing and digital locker kind of facilities. So a lot of uh, interesting things. And at a country scale of 1.25 billion people who are already enrolled on Aadhaar uh, must be an amazing journey to build something of this scale. And so I think, uh, you know, without taking too much uh, time, I would love for uh, Pramod to tell us this story and enlighten us and inspire us to do something similar. So over to you, Pramod. Thank you so much, Naren. Uh, Naresh, it's been a pleasure uh, being here and hello, everyone everyone. Uh, thanks for uh, being here. Uh, I'm not very sure, frankly, I'm not sure how much of uh, details I can cover given 30 minutes. That's the talk, right? How we built Aadhaar and UPI, open source, how we scaled it up, um, the pain points <laughs> that we had to go through. Uh, but I'll, give, I, I'll, I'll try to give you a very high level view why India is doing what we're doing. And that's a very important understanding you ought to have. Uh, what is digital infrastructure for uh, a billion people even mean? What, why do we even build digital infrastructure, right? Uh, that idea of digital infrastructure building for large uh, inclusive uh, development has been the theme that uh, we have been following in the last 12 years and we are not stopping. We continue to build a lot more and I'll probably mention that few of and why, what we are up to these days uh, towards the end. Uh, so let me just share and I'll get started. So um, I want to rewind ourselves, you know, into 2008. Uh, not too far ago, uh, this is when iPhone came out, right? And uh, I, Android uh, coming out next year. Uh, India only had 17 percentage of people who are banking. And that's, this is, you'll be surprised, right? Uh, why even in 2008, we couldn't get, um, you know, one fifth of the country was banking and, you know, 80 percentage was not uh, in the formal banking system. And that's a terrible state to be in and that you don't want to be in that situation at all as we were, you know, getting smartphones and internet and digitization. Uh, inclusion is an important part of that and bringing everyone together is part of that. Uh, at the same time, India, India is also highly uh, sort of socialistic in that nature. We, uh, we provide lots of subsidies and uh, LPG cylinder subsidy is something which every middle class, uh, many of you, or your parents for sure, uh, would have uh, gone through and availed it, uh, benefited it. Uh, probably not today because a lot of us have given up the subsidy for um, uh, deserving people. Uh, but the, the total entitlement, the size of entitlement, uh, reached $50 billion, US dollars, in 2008. It's very, very important to understand. We were spending roughly about 18% of our uh, annual budget and 2.5% of GDP at that time, um, straight away into subsidy, direct subsidies. And it was very clear that direct subsidies were not reaching the people because the way we were giving subsidies through the supply chain meant many middlemen, many middle um, middlemen leakages, massive leakages. And some of the newer programs had less leakages, but some of the older program like fertilizer and PDS and so on have you know, much larger leakage. And uh, diversion as well, not only leakage, diversion of the goods, because this was pre-subsidized goods being distributed, right? That's how we got everybody. And imagine even 50% or 40% leakage meant 20, 25 billion dollars every year, someone is pocketing that the poor people are supposed to get or deserving people are supposed to get. Uh, even, um, even, even 2008 or even partly today, and many of your entrepreneurs, you must realize that 
many of our formal systems, products and services, such as um, three years ago, for example, four years, three years, four years ago, 2016, when we were sitting with SEBI, we realized the um, we had tapered the number of people in the capital market. We couldn't get more than uh, 20, 22 million. 22 million, I think, was the number at that time SEBI was talking to us about. Uh, we couldn't get more than 22 million people. But we have 900 million people, adults, right? 1.3 billion population, but 900 million adults. And out of that, only 22 million uh, is even participating in mutual funds and so on. Uh, banking was low, mutual funds, nobody is having access to. Lending is a story you have heard many times. Our GDP to lending ratio is very low. We don't lend. We lend really large amount of sums to large companies or large set of people. A uh, few set of people, so few large transactions. The entire system is set up with that. But if you unbundle it, you will realize that why do we have only 10% of the country availing products and services that we, we at least 50-60% of the country should be getting? Is because the, the more and more regulation, uh, more and more strictness in the system meant onboarding cost, cost of onboarding, the KYC, PMLA rules to adhere to uh, see originally seen and verified kind of rules in the bank, that added cost of acquisition. Then to engage with you, that you are lending or your savings, uh, getting mutual funds, you know, regular SIP investment, if you want to do, you have to get paperwork, you know, and getting paperwork to invest a thousand rupees is not even you can't even get it. I'll tell you the uh, mutual fund distributors in India today get 0.5% um, of the 50.5% 50, 50 of the commission. And so, but if the KYC cost is 1,500 rupees, that was the KYC cost for CP5. Uh, that means mutual fund distributor needs to get a check of 3 lakh rupees, 300,000 uh, rupees, even before they can recover the KYC cost. That means sign up cost. And who can write 3 lakh or 300,000 rupee check? And this is 22 million people, 20 to 25 million people at best, which is why the market had tapered I and mean, nobody was going. So the idea of dramatically reducing acquisition cost, servicing cost, and most importantly, in the area of jobs, lending, especially blue collar jobs, jobs, lending, and so on, uh, data is also, the cost of trust is very high. That means no one trusts a small SME who walks into a bank or a, a roadside vegetable vendor who wants a 10,000 rupee uh, loan for a day or two. Um, nobody gets them. So it's, a, it's finally they are in a completely informal uh, economy. That's what happens, right? Most of the products and services because the, the, the cost of uh, regulation, cost of paperwork, cost of acquisition, cost of engagement, cost of trust is so high. The idea was to reduce that dramatically. But interestingly, India didn't go on to solve them. So government of India and regulators, serendipitously, I don't think everything was very planned, okay? But when you look back, uh, at least at least till 2014, we, there, was a, there was a theory in a lot of our mind. And we were saying that if you build the digital building blocks, like the way internet was constructed, like identity as a building block, payment as a building block, data as a building block, uh, E-sign, e digital signature as a building block, digital building block. Then people like you who are listening today, many of your entrepreneurs, I'm very sure, listening to you would combine them and provide solutions to the diverse, uh, uh, diverse country, as diverse as us, India. Instead of government solving it and government building solutions and portals to sign up, you know, that doesn't make any sense. Rather, we build infrastructure that allows you to build solutions, right? That it's a very interesting way of looking at that. And fast forward to 2020, we saw 50 billion US dollars sent out of that 35, I think it's about 35, 36 billion now, uh, is sent directly to the bank account of the people today. And it's an amazing transformation we did actually within such a short period, getting 650 million people, unique other holders in the bank account. We have more bank accounts, but unique people with bank account is 650 million people who are financially addressable. That means du during COVID, for example, we transfer 450 million uh, uh, people, 450 million people received 
uh, subsidies directly into the bank account while America was writing checks and sending it to home during the COVID time, right? To support um, because of the you know, tanking of the economy. We amazingly well managed this indirect sub subsidy program to what's called a direct cash fund. We run the largest cash, direct cash transfer program in the world today. And this is a study that came out in 2020 December, even better. And if you have not seen it, you should definitely read from um, Bureau of International Settlement, which is the Central Bank of Central Banks in Basel. They said India would have taken from in 2011, we were around 20 percentage penetration. And if you had taken um, normal route to get everybody to bank account, we would have taken 46 years. India would have taken 46 years if you plot the GDP curve, and we would have reached it. And we, in four decades, we would have reached 80 percentage banking. India took flat six years. So it's an amazing story that India compressed a four decade long development cycle into less than a decade, getting 80 plus percent of the people into the banking system. Not because we, you know, there was many things that came together, many things, okay? And no one can just take the credit. One person can take the credit. Aadhaar alone can't take credit. Regulators can't take credit. Entrepreneurs can't alone take credit. Geo can't take credit. Mobile phone, you know, serendipity is beautiful. In India, everything happened together to make that dramatic leap. But the underpinning digital infrastructure played a very pivotal role, what we call India's stack, right? And that is primarily between the three layers, the cost of acquisition layer, which is the identity layer. We have now Aadhaar, 1.31 billion people use Aadhaar. We do a billion Aadhaar authentication, digital authentication. We don't even know how many people actually use other photocopies. Okay, we have no idea. But billion authentication every month on other, and PAN is an authenticable uh, instrument now. GSTN is an establishment identity, and you can do a KYC on it now using uh, GSTN APIs. And they're all API-based systems that are platform in nature, opening up those APIs to the market for you all, many of you to innovate. And on, even in, by the way, Aadhaar was even used um, by many people, although it was not compulsory, it was used for vaccination as well. Uh, it's amazing that how much we achieved in vaccination, right? And second layer is the cost of engagement layer. So cost of trust, cost of acquisition, once you acquire, you need to engage them. Engagement has to be paperless and presentless and low cost, high volume for India, to be an inclusive program, we need to be high volume, low cost, um, paperless and presentless. And that's what many of the infrastructure, now look at it, e-sign alone didn't solve anything. It is just a building block for digital signature. Aadhaar payment bridge is to send money to Aadhaar also. AEPS, I don't know how many of you even know, is what India Post, India Postman uses that with the device on their handheld in front of your home. So we never took banks to villages, by the way, but we took banking to villages. So it's an amazing thing. Branches never got open, but India Post is now doing banking at the doorstep of, you know, very, very large number. We do 300 million transactions on APS and UPI, of course, if you, you, know, you have to be living under the rock if you didn't hear about UPI. But again, what is UPI? It's only a protocol. It's a UPI was just a set of API specification with a settlement network that allowed money to be moved on the rail, on the digital rail from, you know, phone pay or Google pay or virus pay and on the merchant side, on the consumer side and the banks and many, many innovations like uh, coupons and vouchers and all being created, right? Many, many of them, uh, um, some of them uh, you would have heard even during the talk today. Oken is the lending protocol. It's a spec again, API specs. If you're a developer, you should be looking at this specification. Oken is a lending spec. UHI, next month, you will see a universal health interface. Again, not a platform, a set of protocols. So we are moving from platforms to protocols. That means open API specification so that you can build the endpoints. Like internet, HTTP was a protocol. But the web server somebody built and browser somebody else built, apps somebody else built, 
application server somebody else built, right? And connecting through HTTP. So UHI, think of UHI like a universal health interface, like UPI, that allows health and wellness services to be provided on one side and consumed on the other side. Who will build those API endpoints? Hopefully all of you will build this API. So government is now going into building open specifications rather than platforms. It's a very important move, right? And we are also doing backend protocol as a foundation effort for commerce, distributed commerce, this completely decentralized commerce protocol, backend protocol.io, you can go check it out. And then we have data, which is the cost of trust. The third layer is the cost of trust. We are dramatically reducing through what? By giving the data back to the people in digitally signed, in a cryptographically protected and end-to-end um, uh, -end encrypted fashion with your consent you are able to do and the first data network probably in the world went live called account aggregator in india and you would have heard a lot of buzz around account aggregator and that's based on the protocol called deepa it's on github by the way all these apis are actually on github if you want to look at the endpoints and take it abroad and build or whatever you need to do and now we, we also have account aggregator and um, personal healthcare records, which is PHR, and DigiLocker, which is opening up credentials. DigiLocker doesn't give data, it gives credentials, proof of license, proof of work, proof of academics, and all that thing is coming through, right? And DiVoc was another effort we did for proof of vaccination. So if you are vaccinated in India, you saw that QR code, it comes from that open source infrastructure called DiVoc. And again, many of them uh, yet to be. Uh, yet to be seen at live like UPI. UPI is a good story, but UHI is new and we are getting some of the new protocols out right now. So it's a good time for all of you to look at the API. But what does India stack at the end of the day? We just built a set of open protocols and core identity platforms and created policies so that many of you can build hundreds of applications on top of that because that is necessary for India. And that's what the learning was, right? We had very nicely set up. Political will was supportive. A very regulators were supportive and but india didn't do like europe we didn't just do only regulatory and law we also built infrastructure building blocks like identity signature and things we talked about data uh, upi as a payment interest api uhi as a health api now we have um, skilling and education apis coming out where a tech platform can connect itself and uh, provide a unified network across the country and this is the real interesting part, right? We managed to, India managed to play these three things very nicely. The policies from regulators and government with a combination of digital infrastructure. Digital infrastructure, why, why do I call it not digital platforms? Because they're not all platforms. They're sometimes just specs, API specs. And the digital infrastructure, who will take advantage of this? Both government and mostly market participants, many of the entrepreneurs like you, uh, who are listening to it. But if you, if you can get these three combinations right, India will do a fantastic job of open policies, open innovation, friendly policy, a set of interoperable building blocks that allow for you to do a better job, a minimalistic infrastructure, and then innovation thriving on top of it by people like you. And that's a difference in India. We were on this side. India was on this side pre-90s opening up, even after 90s, by the way. We were, we were still... Literally, um, you know, Air India just went away, right? Look at it. We were government was building it. Government was a regulator. Government was building it. Specification government was operating it. Government was running the whole thing. And but US on the other side outsourced the entire thing to uh, tech uh, companies, and that's also facing a lot of lashback, as you see, anti-competitive measures and winner-take-all behavior. Uh, extreme monopolistic behavior that is getting pushed back. And India is trying to take a sort of a middle ground, if you will. And that is where we are saying we cannot just completely outsource our, because we are also a very inclusive society and nobody will take care of vulnerable section of our society unless the cost of transaction, cost of engaging them, and cost of innovation and cost of trust is dramatically reduced. But through this green thing in the middle, if you can create interoperability and dramatic reduction in cost, you as innovators will build innovation. That is our thesis, right? You will build innovation that can now span beyond the top 10 percentage, go to the top 30, 40, 50 percentage of our country, beyond which it gets 
really hard. The, the, the India 3 gets hard. India 2 is a great aspirational uh, 300, 400 million people that you can reach out now because the cost of uh, business and cost of innovation has come down. And you have a lot of easy money flowing, right, India, because all of you are innovating. Uh, and we are not stopping there. By the way, if you look at the play, we are repeating the same national health stack where UHI is coming, uh, national education stack where uh, education and skilling interfaces are coming, where ed tech platforms and public and private schools and tutors and mentors can create a unified network without a central platform. Most of these protocol play have nothing centralized, no central platform whatsoever, fully decentralized innovation, but innovated by you, all of you. But so if you don't adopt, India will not see the value that we can potentially derive. And India is thus accelerating formalization. That's a real play here. Ensuring that half half, half the billion people, 500 million adults and um, maybe still more children uh, as they are in the education sector, for example, are truly bought into the formal economy. There's no reason that they need to go to local money lender and local savings, unregulated savings and so on. They should have the same access that all of us have. And But we are not solving it, formalizing it by building solutions. We are, build, we are formalizing by distributing the ability to solve, distributing the ability to you, ability to government, distributing the ability to Samaj, NGOs as well. So um, when you're the education sector, for example, there are a lot of NGOs who are working. All of them are innovating, social entrepreneurs, for example. So if they, innovation comes from that, you know, that all of you who are looking at the APIs and saying, I can now, innovate and connect to the grid and suddenly i have a large uh, low cost way of transacting uh, to a large millions and millions of people the upa was the starting point but we are not stopping and we are doing a set of uh, infrastructure play most of them protocol play and watch out for, for those apis many of those apis are out there drafts out it's all on github you should really track and start doing uh, uh, new age uh, startups that allows healthcare and education and everything to reach eventually the 300, 400 million who's supposed to get it. Thank you. Wow. Stop that yeah. and maybe yeah. go back to Q&A or, yeah, Nadesh. What a brilliant uh, talk. So many interesting stats and so many interesting ideas and uh, the energy, amazing <laughs> energy you carry there, Pramod. Thanks a lot. Uh, I think we have a couple of questions, uh, if you would like to uh, take a chance at them. Yeah. So, um, okay. So, the one, um, one important thing we want to understand here is that no single entity in India is building a central big platform through which we are solving uh, India's problems. India's problems are wicked problems right really complex and when it comes to sustainability and environment even gets bigger and bigger and more complex there for us uh, so we these building blocks are built by many people so this is a little bit tricky for developers right for other you have to go to uidi for upi you have to work with banks and npci for uhi you can work with nha so there is a national health authority where section 8 not for profit com uh, company has been set up by health ministry to create digital infrastructure for health. Similarly, you're doing that for education. So where can I find all the APIs? Not really in one place. Maybe one of the things we can do is that uh, some of us as volunteers, all of us are volunteers in the system, and we have many volunteers from, I'm very sure, some of you are listening as well, uh, who are participating in this. Uh, maybe we can put together a set of uh, you know, pointers. IndiaStack.org India is a good place to start. That, but I think we have built a lot more now. So we might, might have to update that page to give you all the API documentation. So that was one question there. And uh, the good thing is that if government were to define themselves as a rail, they are the rail builders, digital rail builders. A rail is means what? Protocol, the API specs. All of you are the platform builders. And it's a very well, it's, a, it, it's like what internet happened, right? It's like internet. You have endpoints that are all built by you, and the rails are defined by the regulator or the government and so on, so that all of us can talk to each other in an interoperable fashion. So 
So uh, yeah, maybe we'll put together some documentation uh, beyond India Tractor at all. Um, could we say demonetization was a kickstart for all this? Then no, actually not really. Um, not really, frankly. I think uh, did did demo uh, give a push to uh, UPI? Yes, it was. It did definitely give a push to UPI. But UPI started in 2013. You know the the idea of UPI. Three, four of us, three of us, literally started brainstorming the idea. And 2014, we started writing the specification for it. And uh, some of the early guys, contributors, maybe even listening, uh, we had a bunch of people, volunteers who are participating early. And 2015 is when we sort of came out and started doing pilots. 2016, it did give a boost. But um, I think we would have done even otherwise because we had geo effect and smartphone, aspiration of young India, the gig economy working, and the VC money pouring, and number of unicorns. You know, many, some, many of you are there. Uh, I, I think generates a lot of momentum for the country. Uh, there is no stop in India. Yeah, it's just, some of them gives good boost, but not. I don't think we can say that's the reason for UPS. Many reasons, right? Yeah. So uh, if if there's no questions, then we can wind up as well. Yeah. Uh, if you don't mind, uh, Pramod, I had one quick question yeah, and sure. yeah. something that gets asked quite commonly is uh, around the security aspect of, uh, you know, Aadhaar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, yeah. So if you, if you, you yeah. know, just. So I'll talk about that. So um, security, um, every building block we are designing, whether the building block is of nature of a platform or the building block is the nature of an API. We have to still think about privacy and security from day one. And this is not an afterthought, right? So in the case of Aadhaar, we had to do a set of uh, security measures that we had to minimalism on the privacy side, which literally captured nothing to um, make sure that it is not a data capture you know, platform, right? And we minimized it, then we had to enact, uh, enact the Aadhaar Act, and then Supreme Court, the second longest debate on the privacy was, you know, that's our vibrant democracy, I think, working. Uh, and, you know, it, but it only strengthened. And the security of the system, um, so far we have no, there was zero hack because I think the Aadhaar system itself is highly protected. It's not even exposed on the internet per se, uh, the biometrics and so on. Even the API, core authentication API endpoints are actually not on the internet. Uh, that is on, uh, we have ring fenced many layers of uh, sub, uh, what you call trusted entities that actually endpoint. So there is no mothership to attack. So you can't bring other down uh, one time what, with one attack on a DOS attack or a DDoS attack or anything like that. There is nothing exposed. We only have some portals and all exposed, but that doesn't stop the other API. Similar to UPI, UPI is also there is the switch is not exposed on the internet, the core switch through which the transaction go. Uh, all the endpoints are so you can attack, try to attack the phone pay endpoint or a you know Amazon pay endpoint or a Bharat pay endpoint. You can try attacking a little bit, but it's like many roads, you know, all connected through this uh, yeah, yeah, big intersection that is not exposed. Uh, so I think you can start stopping few, uh, but otherwise um, uh, we've been very careful with that. And but the uh, security itself, we we are we are, even from Aadhaar, you can see that. I don't know whether you guys looked at other. We were using 2048 cryptographic techniques uh, for uh, encryption, digital signature. Every API is digitally signed. This is in 2010 when I put up other API. Every API is digitally signed. The, even the API input output is digitally signed. And then channel encrypted. So we had a channel encryption, packet encryption, and signature. So you can look at the API specifically. You will see enormous thought that has really gone through both in privacy and security. But uh, uh, but it's a cat and mouse game. I think we just have to be on top of that and constantly upgrade every uh, system. That is why we are actually more and more going towards protocol. It's a very important understanding, okay? Platforms create a um, little bit of a centralization. Platforms create store of value. Platforms capture value. Rails, on the other hand, is a, enables flow of value, not a store of value. Because rail itself, there is nothing you can store in the rail. 
it's a http what do you store in http there is no it's a it's a flow right http enables flow smtp enables flow so, so it's very important that the protocol play enables flow in a decentralized manner i think that is why many of the new plays we are doing from upi upi usi uh, now we are doing for health, health uh, what do you call uh, education and skilling uh, you will see this api and beckon is a commerce protocol there is no platform there is no central platform, completely decentralized. So what do you attack? I think that's a brilliant insight for people to take away in terms of uh, why the move to protocol and it how- It also means that, Nare, it also means that people who are listening, the APIs are all coming out. Commerce, distributed commerce, decentralized commerce APIs, decentralized health and wellness care APIs. This is a time to play either a you know, massive, um, business side game like Shopify's of the world who played, right? Uh, who went and actually acquired a small businesses to provide, uh, you know, a wellness practice people or a homestay in Kerala or Tripura uh, can get a small Shopify like platform who is now connected to the grid without you worrying about consumer acquisition. So the moment you have a create a grid that is an open grid, many entrepreneurs can now focus on value provisioning on the edges without trying to create a monopolistic large platform, which is possible if you get raised a lot of money, which is not so bad, but not everybody can do that. Yeah. Absolutely. I think there are a few more questions that have come in. If you have uh, time to promote, we could take them. Yeah, sure, yeah. And I'll let you, I don't know what the timing is. Yeah, go ahead and Narisha. Uh, I think it's there on the Q&A. Oh, Q&A, just... okay. Yeah. Yeah, so what about privacy law? I think it's a, a brilliant cost, question. In fact, legally, we were not even sure whether we have a right to privacy. Is right to privacy constitutionally embedded? And then we went through that argument, right? It sounded crazy to us, many of us. Listen, what do you mean by right to privacy is not, we don't have right to privacy. Actually, people debated it. Where, is, where in the constitution, where in the laws exist? Ex ex it's fundamental. Supreme Court had to make up that mind first. Supreme Court then decided that privacy indeed, indeed, is fundamental right to the every Indian, but not, you know, absolute right. So there is a difference between absolute right and a foundation. I mean, there are situations where your privacy will be overridden for the largest section. No different from you going to airport and somebody frisking you physically and you feel uncomfortable. It doesn't matter. Because that's your, you are giving up your privacy for the larger good, right? And or in the COVID scenario, when the when you know you are, you are you could spread the disease and you are isolating and being known to everybody is uh, you are giving up your privacy in one sense. So privacy is not absolute; it's fundamental. Then came the debate about whether other is uh, valid, and then Supreme Court made a uh, very you know very good decision about indeed it is uh, valid. Nothing wrong in using it. But overuse of other need to be controlled. So that, that was the debate. Then Supreme Court insisted that India must have our own privacy law and the draft privacy bill. And we, are, we have quite like GDPR. So the question, do we have something like GDPR? Yes, it is very close uh, to coming through in the parliament. Uh, but all of us must speak up and ensure that the government is uh, pushed and uh, forced and in pressured into passing the bill. They have not passed the bill yet, but it is very close to passing the bill. And our bill will cover not only data protection, it will also cover data empowerment. That means the moment that bill comes, all of us can now ask a copy of our data from everywhere we are leaving our digital footprint, in the, from a hospital, from your employer, from your taxi company, where you, from your, everywhere you're working, doesn't matter. You will have the right to get your data. So it's a very powerful bill. Uh, let's let's hope that it comes. Yeah, that's one question there. What uh, does it get long to get accepted by Gov? He, he, interestingly, it is um, uh, almost all government work it takes a long time. Any digital infrastructure plays a minimum a decade long. And so a lot of us have gained extreme patience. By the way, our patience capital is very high. We will work on it, 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 and it takes time. We know it takes time because regulators have to move, government has to move, politicians have to understand the value. Uh, 
then we have to society has to embrace it too you can't ask society to make a leap frog no leap frog happens actually through leap frog right many many small steps so we have to be very patient about it but all of us some of us who are in the digital infrastructure game is here for two three decades going to be there building it up so no particular hurry but we we will do systematically because of that uh, our law uh, reg and regulations marketplace like you and society is indeed aligned and incentive correct ready for that move to happen uh, by the way i don't even know whether you have read the original upi paper in 2015 original to upi paper we have talked about food coupons and we have talked about loyalty points and all and upi credit on upi we have not even seen half of that actually materializing it yet yet but you know no hurry we'll do it one step at a time i think you know the society has to be ready so that it takes time but you need capacity and capital and you need to understand a lot of value well. yeah erase digital identity yeah the very interesting question so um, we don't have right to be forgotten uh, yet in the law uh, it all it's a sort of even in europe by the way right to be forgotten was over stressed and i don't think if you read it it's not that you can go to a bank and say i want to delete a bank account you can delete a bank account even today but you can't be forgotten because they have regulatory mandate to keep it for so many years so the history that you indeed banks in spain for example or in uk will remain in that system but i think the right to be forgotten they are forcing it in a commercial on google and facebook and where there is no regulatory need for you to keep the data uh, they are enforcing the right to be forgotten but our aadhar is a root identity it is an identity that is birth to death it's not an identity that is virtual and throw revocable and uh, deletable it is an identity that you are born here you get an aadhar number and nobody ever in in the time of humanity gets the same number it's your number right and nobody else ever will be allocated that number and you can't change it it's not non revocable which is one of the reason why usage of aadhar was actually cur curtailed and controlled saying that you need to create derived identities for transactional purposes so that you can get right to be forgotten you can actually revoke it you can cancel it and you can move on and so on but social security number the us you can't cancel it nothing you can do every country has some citizenship id or number that you can there's that's a root identity that you don't like a birth certificate think of other like a birth certificate because half of india doesn't register birth so think of that okay you can cancel that part but you can cancel derived identity okay if we have time maybe we can take more i don't know in the rest uh, stop me okay uh, yeah yeah these yeah. are topics we can never end you know <laughs> no you're doing a fantastic job so we have five in literate minutes. section yeah i think it's a uh, again sanjay singh question on adoption of illiterate this is one of the reasons why india sometimes we feel a lot of us right who, who are educated we'll say why can't we have credit on ube why can't we just do this um we are we have sometimes we run out of our patience that why is not government moving uh, it's also to do with this is why regulators are also you remember upi started with 2000 rupee limit <laughs> you know and then we slowly and steadily but even then you will see the gullibility of indians for example they get conned right poor a uh, lot of people you know because they are digitally unaware uh you know get called and say oh i am from the bank can you give me the otp and they'll few calls later they think they are actually from the bank and actually give you an otp right so it's very easy to you know cheat people and gullible people it's a concern it is indeed sanjay is a concern and we believe again i personally don't think government alone can solve everything i am a believer that society all of us uh, entrepreneurs who are doing fintech for example should also take a moment to take time to create awareness best practices in your community wherever you are working your user base if you are only talking about top 10 user base is not so bad but if you are one of those uh, social entrepreneurs who are working every one of us should use the opportunities that we are getting to continue to push and increase that awareness tell our parents tell our uncles tell our neighbors to what to do what not to do be watchful and it takes a while before the system gets used to it but we are thrusted into this digital economy whether we like it or not right and the 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 one generation that is not used to it find it very hard 
to make that switch. Quite like industrial revolution, we are going through the information revolution right now, and the speed is enormous. But Sanjay, your concern is valid, and all of us do sleep over that as well. How do we get a billion people with 22 languages, hundreds of variants of languages, so much diversity in culture to actually understand all this stuff, right? Maybe the way think about the decentralization. Think, think about, don't think of a centralized solution. Think of decentralized solution that everybody can do a little bit and then hopefully collectively society moves forward, right? Yeah, that's the first Venkat question was somewhat that as well. And I answered about erasing the identity. And other we use the Indian railways and transport for booking and tracking. Again, Theoretically, Aadhaar is an identity. You could have logged in with Aadhaar, like you log in with Google. You could have done it. But I talked to you about the earlier question. Aadhaar is a root identity and it is permanent identity. Uh, it is not revocable. It's, so we have to, we, there was a Supreme Court and asked the balancing of the Aadhaar usage. So what we, a lot of us technologists believe is that they will be derived identities. So you, so you, for example, as an entrepreneur can create a, hot check, you know, nice open ID provider, uh, put up an open ID wrapper and maybe get people to sign up and then go and sell it to Taj or any hotels or anybody to say, use your identity to log in and then they can adopt you rather than they're adopting the government identity. You know, that gets very tricky. And also other is everywhere, be other being everywhere may not be the right thing for us in the long run. Okay, so they create derived identity and create derived platform, all of you. And then that can be used, whether it's a card, whether it's a QR code, whether it's a digital ID, whether it's a crypto ID, whatever it is, you know, create whatever you need to do so that I can do many other things on top of that rather than using other everywhere. Cool. I think Pramod, we'll take one last question and we'll wrap up. Too much digital is boon or bane? <laughs> it's a very interesting question. Who knows? Who knows? Actually, we don't know. Uh, but one of the things we are making sure, while the digit extreme rapid digitization is going, see, this is like your parents would have asked the same thing to you, by the way. So it's a generation problem that every generation that goes through, you'll say, is too much computers good or not? Uh, books we used to read, and we, before that, we used to play physically. Who knows what's right or wrong in the wrong line? Somebody else will figure it out. But I think there's always a moderation balancing act. But I have a feeling that what we are doing is that while the digitization momentum, because at the end of the day, internet value of internet in terms of democratizing and creating level playing, we are leveling, leveling a lot. Look at media, look at everything else. We are leveling, so that leveling uh, is a good thing, but at the same time, overuse, over gaming, over computer spend, over anything, over overeating is a bad thing. I think we just have to balance our act. But India, from our perspective, we are focusing while digitization is going on, can we create interoperable and portability infrastructure with the data protection bound into it? That's what focus is. That's what all these APIs are all about. Interoperability of the grid, portability of my data and credential, and protection. Right? That's what we are after. Uh, if we can do that, Hopefully, we can balance innovation and inclusion, all we can, uh, while protection and, uh, uh, because we can't go back to dark ages. I, I think it just doesn't make any sense, right? We just, you know where we are going back. <laughs> We're just going forward, all stressed. But be very wary, uh, be thoughtful, um, and our democratic setup, hopefully, uh, creates enough institutions and opportunities for us to debate AI, biases, crypto, what is right, wrong, what should children do, hopefully we'll go through the right debates and uh, trust in the democracy and trust in all of us. <laughs> hopefully we'll do a better job, I think. Yeah. All right. Thank you. That's awesome. Thanks a lot, Pramod. Thank you. Bye.